Good morning, family. Good morning. Hey, where's all the dads in here? Just raise your hand. Let's just say happy Father's Day. Yes, we celebrate you guys today. So does the Lord. He is good. Amen. He is always good. We get to think about him. You know, we talk about in scripture, we learn about meditating on his word. Who here, who here knows how to meditate? Who here has ever worried for like any length of time? Who's here has worried about something for like a day? So you all know how to meditate. We just have to change the focus. Okay, so you got it down. I was thinking this morning, actually, I had a conversation with someone, but also this morning before I came here, I had this thought, I was praying about it. How it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. It's in his presence where stuff gets dealt with. Sickness, disease, problems in our life, transformation in the mind that needs to happen. It's in his presence that that happens. So he inhabits the praises of his people. We want to resist the enemy trying to pull us into fear because it doesn't say he inhabits our fear. So we resist fear and then we focus on the Lord because when we focus on him, he inhabits that place of where we're praising him. And like right alignment, right alignment, amen? We line up with him, his presence comes, and his presence deals with things. And he loves to do that. Because as we celebrate fathers today, think about it, he is our father. He's our perfect father who loves to connect with us and handle things for us, to heal us, to cleanse us, to show us how much he loves us. He's all about that. So this morning we're going to praise him and just... Praise Him with that in mind that He inhabits your praises. That as soon as we set our heart on looking at Him, He's there to experience and encounter us. Amen? Well, let's pray, and then I have a few announcements for you. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and say happy Father's Day. Thank you for loving us the way that you do, for accepting us the way that you do, for caring for us the way that you do. We ask this morning, Lord, that you be blessed. As we have this service where we focus on you and worship you and come to your word, Lord. But Lord, I ask that you bless each father here, Lord. We have fathers. We even have spiritual fathers. I ask that you bless each one. Today, as we celebrate dads, that you show them how much they're loved, how important they are, Lord, and that they would feel special today. So we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So a few announcements. We have the diaconate meeting today, Sunny Deacon or Deaconesses that are here at 12.30 um, after service. Um, of course, we still need Sunday school and nursery volunteers, so pray about that. See if the Lord puts it on your heart. Just close your eyes for a second. There, you put it on your heart. Did you feel that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. We have... Um, what else do we have? Oh, with kitchen help. Sometimes with kitchen, we're having, um, need some help in there cleaning up. Two options. We have dishes to wash sometimes or just cleaning off the tables when we get done with stuff. Or if you brought food, you can take your dirty dish home. That's also an option. <laughs> That's how I like to do it. Because I'm always visiting, let's be honest. If I bring something, I'm going to visit and I'm just going to take it home dirty because I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to get to it here. I'm not... Um, one that, you know, we're praying for Patrick Porter. I wanted to, to let you all know that he passed away. Oh, no. And so this morning, we want to just be aware and thankful to the Lord for receiving him the way that he does. That's the one thing that's amazing about being a believer is that we know that passing from this life to the next is being, is being received by God. Right? It's, it feel, we still feel the pain of loss. But we also get to step into that place of joy knowing that God received them. That's special. That's special. And we had this, where, yeah, this sir that came up on one of Patrick's friends. Thanks for coming. Yeah, this is Anna. Anna? They were long-time friends. Long-time friends. And pray for Anna and Ellie, too, because I know the grieving process, it's real and it's hard. But in that process, we're just thanking the Lord for receiving them. And then... Um, yeah, let's just pray right now, because I know he had a lot of friends that couldn't be up here. <laughs> Lord, we come before you right now. We thank you for Patrick, Lord. 
the more stories I, I've heard about him, the more I realize that he was one of those rare souls who loved well, that it came natural to him to reach out and show people grace, show people love. He found joy in, in not the recognition of that. I, I love hearing the stories how he would even get, hide in, in ways and sneak money to kids so they could get candy. He wasn't looking for them to recognize him as much as he was looking to see the joy in their face as they got to run to the candy store. The stories of him, Lord, remind me of you. So I ask, Lord, that just give him a hug from everybody here. And I ask, Lord, that you would bless each person here that's known him and been his friend. Bring comfort, Lord, to their hearts and speak truth to their hearts, Lord, as they suffer this very real loss, but also know that you've received him and that he's gained so much. So, Lord, we give you glory and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see so many smiling faces this morning. You know, I, I when I yesterday when I was thinking about the call to worship, I prayed to God. I said, God, please lead me to the right thing to say this morning. And I just flipped my Bible open, and I'll be darn exactly where he wanted me to read. And it was Psalm 103. And after I read it, I said, this is perfect for Father's Day, because it's the way David sees the Lord. And, and it's a good thing for us to be able to see what David saw in God and how we can see the same thing. Now, it's, it's Psalm 103, and it goes from uh, verse 1 through 18. So it's kind of long. Please bear with me. And if you think about the words... Uh, concentrate on those. I think you'll appreciate why I'm going to read this whole thing. But David says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord's works works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor he will uh, harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far as so far he has, he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on, on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with his, their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. So the Lord is with us always, and like a father, he has compassion on his children, on us. And he knows where we were formed. He knows where we came from the dust. And even though on this, as Pastor was saying about Patrick, on this world, we're gonna move on. And that will be eventually be forgotten but we will always be remembered for eternity with the Lord in heaven. So it's a, it's a very comforting thought for all of us. Please close your eyes for a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just listen for a minute and just hear, because the Holy Spirit's speaking it now, so just hear him say, I love you so much. Just to receive all that you have for us. <clears throat> Jesus. 
Jesus, we thank you. I know we've had some people here that have um, they just need some healing in their body. If you're struggling with anything in your body right now, just raise your hand. Maybe you're worried about some doctor's news, anything like that. As you see hands go up, just people around them, just if you're near them, you can lay your hand on their shoulder or just stretch out a hand towards them. We're just going to invite the Lord to start touching them. So if you have anything going on in your body, keep your hand up for a minute so everyone can see. Where are we going? Holy Spirit, just come. Yeah, just begin to pray towards them. Remember your prayers move the mountains. a religious practice that doesn't have any relationship, relational value. We come, we sit, we listen, we go. But when we ask the presence of God to be here, we always want to respond to Him. We don't ever want to treat God's presence. That's, that's why I love to pray over people because if we feel God's presence come, we don't ever invite somebody into our house and say, hey, go sit over there in the room and they don't talk to Him the rest of the time. <laughs> All we do is say hi, and then we say bye when they leave. When they leave, they're like, man, they invited us over for dinner. They ate without us. <laughs> Did they look at you when they were, you were eating? No. Right? We invite the Lord in where we're intentionally paying attention for his presence. So that way, when we feel him, we ask him what we can do so he'll respond. Because that's where he moves. So just pray with me. Holy Spirit, we... We thank you for your goodness in abiding with us. Jesus, you are amazing. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and to understand what you did for us and what you made available to us. Father, we give you glory today. So Lord, you see the needs here, so I ask that you would bless our family here, Lord, beyond what they need. That you would give them, Lord, things to be able to take care of their needs, but also the desires of their hearts, Lord. I ask for a blessing over this church family, Lord. And I just declare, Lord, as, as our economy is doing what it's doing, I know inflation and all that's going up, I just say that your provision will take care of us. That you have this in your hand and we trust you. So we give you glory and we thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We get to be excited about his presence. I'm 
I'm telling you, if you don't practice already during the week at home, you have all that time. You know, one of the things that God gave us when He gave us time was just the ability to be with Him. To sit with Him, to practice being in His presence, to practice hearing. He wants to talk to us. This isn't, this isn't a dead religious experience. Like, God wants to talk to us. If there's one thing that I ask the Lord to get through to all of us here, is how much He wants to be with us. That He would make our hearts understand that the God of the universe wants to just sit with you. How many, how many when, what, how, this wasn't that long ago when Guy Fieri came into town, he was signing cookbooks, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I think rightfully so, like he's amazing, he's done a lot, he's well known, he's done a lot in the community, I thought that, that was awesome. People rushing down to make sure they get the signed copy, right? I missed it. <laughs> I missed it. But this is the thing. It got me thinking about when Jesus shows up, when the presence of God's there. I mean, are we tempted to run like to a celebrity or somewhere to get something like that? And then when the Lord shows up, we hardly pay mind. He's here. He's here. We want to live in such a way that when his presence comes, we run into it. That we're asking, what should I do? It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fun. And it's supposed to be easy. He wants to be near to us. So if I could have the kids come forward so we can release you guys for Sunday school. Yes. You notice how they get more and more bold every week? Yes. Ready? Let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these kids, Lord, that you've given your spirit to. I ask, Holy Spirit, right now that you would teach them to recognize and understand your spirit with such clarity and understanding, Lord, that they won't miss a thing, Father. I pray, Lord, that you will launch them into your kingdom where they will know how you think, they will know what you do, and they'll run with boldness and carry you everywhere they go. So on Sunday school, Lord, I pray that you would impart love to them this morning, that you would impart grace to them, and you impart understanding that goes far beyond their years, that they would walk in wisdom, and that they would be blessed with you. So we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys have fun this morning. You feel free to work. God bless you guys. Thank you. Oh, they're awesome. Isn't God good? I had something this morning I was, I was thinking about uh, after worship like that. Do you ever get messed up like when you're just worshiping the Lord and then it's like, oh, I think he's messing things up. <laughs> I hope I'm still speaking on the same thing. I love being in his presence. I love spending time with him. Four songs is hard for me. I feel like we just warmed up. You know what I mean? Oh, God is good. <clears throat> this is what I felt like you brought to mind this morning. You know, being a Christian is about learning what we get to do, not about focusing on what we can't do. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when we become Christian, we decide we want to follow Christ. The first thing that kind of comes is we, we, we well, maybe some of you have had this experience. That as you're coming to the Lord, you're made aware of the fact that you've sinned and you've done all kinds of stuff wrong. And you feel convicted and you want to get saved, so you say a prayer. And you, you know, there's different versions of the right prayer, you know, that's out there, I guess. And then once you start following them, you get your list of what you're not supposed to do. So when you become a Christian, here's a list of everything you're not supposed to do. And then in a subtle way, the enemy kind of twists it to where now becoming a Christian is about knowing everything that you can't do and then going out into the world and making sure you tell everybody what they can't do. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's lame. That's lame. Because it's like this. This is why, as Christians, we don't, we don't do good in the judgment arena. <laughs> you ever had a kid, like, <clears throat> sometimes, all, for those of you that have multiple kids and have raised them all the way up, you've probably seen this many times. 
But you have a kid maybe in your home who's a rule follower and one that's not, right? And so the rule follower, if you say, hey, don't do this, that one's like, you got it, mom or dad. You know, I got you. I'm going to hold that line. I'll die here, right? And they literally will because about half an hour later, you run in there, there's this huge fight going on, and the one's hitting the other. Mom or dad said we can't do that, right? You're like, that doesn't excuse this behavior. What are you doing? Knock it off, right? Sometimes as believers, we could look like that. Like we come to Christ, we get grace and all that. Then we're out in the world like, he said you can't do that. Does that make sense? Where we walk out in the world and it's like we've had the best day of our lives with salvation. And it's like it doesn't work where you have the best day of your life with him. And you go out and make it somebody's worst day of their life dealing with you. (laughs) Right? It doesn't mean there's not right and wrong. It just means here's how we get to that point. We get to that point of right and wrong by following Jesus. When you follow a holy God, you start walking away from things that aren't holy. But the focus is on following him. See, it doesn't mean what I just said. It doesn't mean that we just get it's a free-for-all. No. But the Christian faith is about learning what we get to do. And I guarantee you, when you learn what you get to do, what you're not supposed to be doing just kind of falls away. Because you're walking with Him. And then your focus is on the right thing. And we've talked about this before. You know, you don't take your kids out and teach them how to drive by going, there's the white line, there's the yellow line. That's where you're supposed to drive, but we're going to teach you what you're not supposed to do. Let's get off the road. Yep, watch out for the pedestrian. You're not supposed to hit them. Yep, you got one. We don't do that, right? It just makes no sense. We don't want to live our faith like that. We're the things that don't make sense in the real world. Like, let's go practice what we're not supposed to do. We don't want to practice our faith like that. Where it becomes about what we're not supposed to do all the time. Like, it's the gospel message. It's good news. God brings us into focus. He says, fix our eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. What are we fixing our eyes on? The one who models what we get to do. So what's one of those things that we get to do? And this is a big one. We've worked through some things over the last couple months. And and then we talked about worship over these last couple weeks. But today we're going to talk about prayer. We get to pray. We get to pray. We're going to learn to focus on what we get to do and how to walk this out with the Lord. Prayer is special. I want, I I just pray that we all get this idea that, that the Lord will implant in each one of us. Prayer is getting to talk and listen to God in its most basic form. You get to do that. Do we realize that we get to do that? Like God's looking at us going, I want to hang out with you. I want you to hear what I have to say and I want you to hear what you have to say. We're going to have a great relationship. This is what prayer is all about. It's about getting to hang out with the Lord. It's about hearing what He's saying and learning to have our hearts transformed. When we're in the presence of God, it helps us. You know, when we're in God's presence, we're not focused so much on what people should or shouldn't be doing as much as we're focused on Him and what He calls us to do. And then we get to go give life. But prayer is an important one because we need to understand some basics about prayer if we're going to know how to come to them. And I just want to go over it. There's a ton that we could go into, but I just want to go to the fundamentals. And one of them is this, is how we understand God's will. You know, if we believe, when we define God's sovereignty, if we believe that He's controlling everything, that everything's set, that everything that happens is God's will, prayer kind of loses value. Right? Because if you're like me, I would ask this question. How can I come and pray? Like, what am, I, what am I supposed to pray if God's already designed everything and He said everything? Like, if I see something happening, I would have to assume it's just God's will. So what happens if I pray against it? If I see something evil happening, you know, maybe wars going on, it's costing people their lives, and I'm praying to the Lord, please intervene, please stop this. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, no, everything that happens is the will of God. Do you see how that robs us of understanding how to pray? Because if we believe that everything is set, that everything that happens is God's will, it doesn't really give us anywhere to go in prayer, at least for me. But when we understand, and Scripture shows this over and over and over and over again, how God makes Himself open to the prayers of His people. That He opens Himself up to, to what we think. 
then we know that prayer is powerful. We understand that in prayer, God's wanting us to come to him, to partner with him in prayer so he can do things on the earth. He's asking us to see things the way he sees so that when we can pray and he act on behalf of our prayers, this is, it's like a divine dance is what prayer is. We come in before the Lord and we're listening to him. He's showing us. You know, for me, prayer was always like going and hanging out with my dad. I could go hang out with him. And if we were on a job, I would look at him and say, hey, what do you want me to do here? And he'd say, do this, 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 and this. And then I'd turn around and say, okay, I'd say it back to him just like that. And I'd go tell people this is what we're going to do. That was like prayer. We come to the Father, we come to the Lord, and we're hanging out with him. We're praying, what do you want me to do, Lord? What's this look like? How do you see things here? And then we listen. And we bring in his word into us, and we sometimes he'll speak to us through his word. Like, hey, I give you examples of it in my word. Sometimes we'll just get a thought that we feel like the Lord gives us instruction on how to handle something. And when that thought comes, we just step out and act on it and see what he does. But prayer is a divine relationship where we're connecting with the Lord to bring his will to earth. Now, here's another one that's important. So when we understand that God makes himself open to us, he makes himself open to us. It's a big one. You can think of like with Moses when God told them, I'm going to destroy this people. They don't listen to me. They're rebellious. And Moses is like, don't. Don't do it, Lord. Here's why. And Lord, after Moses makes his case, the Lord's like, okay, we'll do it that way. God wasn't playing a game with them. God's not dishonest. God wasn't going, you know what? I think I'll say I'm going to destroy the people, but I'm really not going to do that because I want to make him have compassion. So he'll then tell me, no, don't do it. And then I'll be okay. And I'll look merciful. That's manipulation, that's dishonest. God's not like that. When God said, I'm going to destroy this people, he meant I'm going to destroy this people. Moses came and said, no, please don't. Here's why. And God's like, yeah, okay. Why? Because he makes himself open to us. Why? Because in the very beginning, the earth started with him going, make man in our image and give them dominion on the earth. He gave us authority here. He still works with us. He still works with us. He's still looking at us as ones that he's given authority and go Pray. Hang out with me, pray, get to know me. Get to understand my will by being in prayer and meditating. I'll teach you what to do. He's, he's, he wants us to co-labor with him to bring his will on the earth. That's the main point. Now get this. You were designed for answered prayers. You were designed for it. You don't have to raise your hands, but maybe in your heart you already feel this, that... There's a number of us that our prayer experience has been almost like praying to a, a wall. Or we talk about the heavens being brass, like I'm praying and there's nothing happening. And sometimes we've been trained to just go, well, you know, pray, talk to the Lord, and then whatever happens, happens. And so prayer is almost like rolling the dice. Or maybe we've done this. You know, because our prayers, we haven't really seen many answered prayers, we, we get as many people to pray as we can. What's the basis of that? You know, or maybe we feel like it can't be done. Or maybe if we get enough people, like somehow that'll convince God. Like, hey, Lord, it's not just me. I brought the whole church. And he's like, well, okay. You know, you ever thought about it? I think about this stuff all the time. Like, I wonder, what did the Apostle Paul do? He was about to be taken out on a ship. There's going to be a shipwreck. A lot of people are going to die. And he turned to hop on Twitter and go, hey, would you pray? We're about to get on. He had no Twitter. He had no Facebook. How did he do it? Where was the prayer chain? I mean, he could send a letter. It's going to go on a boat. He'll be there next year. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like he could be like, hey, you know what? Barbara's sick. She's, you know, she's having a baby, but she's sick. She may pass away. Send a letter to Timothy by donkey. And hopefully if he gets, if it gets to his church and enough people pray, we can get something to happen. No, he didn't have this. He didn't have this mode, the modes of communication that we have today. So what did he do? I think about Jesus. No Facebook, no Twitter, no cell phone. He couldn't text it out. A lot of those things are such a distraction. Do you notice that? I've caught myself doing this. How many times when something horrible comes up in your life that you want to pray about, like the idea comes, pray about this, that the first thing you do is like, yeah, we got to pray about this. Distraction. This phone won't answer your prayer. Neither will Facebook, neither will any of that other stuff. They're distraction from who do we come to? To the Lord. We come to the Lord. 
So we're made, we're designed for answer prayer. When I come to the Lord, I come to Him like this. I thank Him, I praise Him, I usually spend time in worship. And when I'm in worship also, one of the things I do is I don't think about the problem. When I'm coming to be in God's presence, I found that sometimes when I come and I'm thinking about the problem, I'm really not worshiping from a pure heart. Like, because I'm distracted. Like, especially, like, when it's financial problems. I'm like, Lord, I praise you. Like, God, please don't let me go broke. Like, no. Like, immediately I'm struggling with the problem and talking about the problem. When I worship him, I'm going to worship him because of who he is. And I'm pushing all that aside. And once I'm right and I'm in line with him in worship, then I start talking to him about whatever the issue is. But then I pay attention to my heart because if I'm walking in fear and no fear, I'm not going to pray from fear. It's no good. That's not bringing faith. I also don't, don't like to come to him as a beggar because I know the begging isn't good either. It's rooted in fear, lack of faith, doubt. Right? I want to come to him as one in faith, as a son who understands. And the only way to get in that right state of mind is in worship. You worship him, you look right at him, and you're praising him for who he is. You're thanking him for what he's done and what his word says. And then you're building that confidence. And then as I come to that place, I feel fear melt off. I feel... The, the doubt go away all of a sudden. Sometimes I don't even have to pray because I'm just like, oh, there it is. The Lord just spoke to my heart. He's going to take care of it. Good. Get back into worship, right? But then other times, there's time for praying. So then I start talking to the Lord. And one of the things I'll do is ask him, how should I pray about this? How should I pray about this? Why is it important to do that? I have some scriptures in here. Well, first of all, the disciples. Remember in Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer, the disciples come and they tell Jesus, teach us to pray. Who do you usually ask to teach you something? Somebody who knows a little bit more about it than you do, right? I, I think that in the Jewish culture, these disciples had been trained to pray their entire life. I mean, it was their culture. They knew the sacrifices. They knew the times to go to the temple. They knew how to, to go and do the different rituals. They knew all this. They had the feasts, the festivals, all the prayers, everything lined out. And yet when they watched Jesus pray, they saw something that they needed to learn. And so they say, teach me to pray. That's why when I come to the Lord, I'd like to spend some time asking, what should I pray? How do I pray about this? <clears throat> Have you ever taken time to do that in prayer, wondering if how Jesus prays look like how you're praying? I do that one a lot. Especially when I come to the Lord and I'm like, Lord, help me. Like, God, where are you? This is, I'm having this struggle. And then I stop and I go, I just don't see Jesus being like, God, help me, where are you? Right? He's confident. He's a son. He knows how to come before the Lord. So I thought to illustrate some of this, we, I just want to go over a story this morning. Because as we learn to pray, we're going to see mountains move. <laughs> God wants you to pray and he wants you to pray because he wants to co-labor with us to do his will. I heard somebody one time, this a long time ago, I might have read it, I can't remember, but it was something along the lines of, well, prayer really isn't about getting God to do something. It's about doing a change inside of you. When you pray, stuff will happen inside of you, but that's also a cop-out if you take that as the only, like, well, no, God just asked me to come pray and ask him to do stuff, not... So that way stuff will actually get done, but just so there'll be transformation in me. Like the more, almost like the more mature you get, the less faith you have, right? Have you ever seen when a new believer comes to the Lord, they're usually on fire, right? They're, I mean, I witnessed this one time. A person on fire for God, they got saved, the stuff they're praying for is happening. They're, they're like, wow, this Bible thing is real. This is good, man. This is awesome. I prayed just like it said, and this happened. And, and I went and prayed for somebody to get healed, and it happened. And they were daring to believe. They were pumped. Like, they would what the charismatic circle would call, like, on fire for God, right? And I watched a leader come up to him and say, hey, just so you know, God does that when you first get saved to kind of build up your faith, to let you know that it's real. But then immediately after, he's going to... He's going to start testing you. And when you get to be a Christian and a believer like me, you're not going to give as many answers to prayer. And I watched this person, just their heart sink. Because they're like, wow. He was working, and, but I guess later. I took him outside afterwards. I said, hey, complete baloney. <laughs> baloney. Trust me. If you want to look like that, then believe what he said. <laughs> There's no faith over there. Keep doing what you're doing. You found it. You're on the right track. Keep doing what you're doing. 
Being on fire is not a one-time deal. Once you get lit by the Lord, it's forever burn. Run with them. That's what prayer is about. So today we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 18. And we'll just briefly go through the story. 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 20. It's the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel where he confronted the priests of Baal. So Elijah on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18. And I think this illustrates something about prayer that we're going to look at because as we're on this journey of prayer, I'm asking the Lord how long we will keep looking at this topic. I feel when I pray during the week, I just feel so much that the Lord wants us all to grasp it because he wants to be close to you. That's, that's what I feel on, the heart, on my heart all week is that the Lord <laughs> wants to be close to you. I'm not up here as the middleman between you and God. I'm thankful that the Lord's allowing me to do this. But he doesn't need me to do it in, in place of him. I'm pointing at him. And I know he wants to encounter each and every one of you and take your, your understanding, your relationship with him, what you get to experience with him to the next level. To where your lives look like Jesus' lives. He wants to do all those things through you. Jesus' stories aren't stuff just to look at and then go, wow, that was amazing. I wish thing we call earth and however time and everything works. God said, at this point in time, with what I want to do on this earth and how I want to make my glory known to the people, I picked them for now. You're picked. You're chosen. But we have to come into alignment with him so he can flow through us and we get his results on earth. Does that make sense? So, 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm just going to read through this story starting in verse 20 and give a little commentary as we go. It says, so eight, or a little background too, sorry. There was a three-year drought leading up to this point where the, the people, God's chosen people had, were walking in idolatry, meaning they, weren't, they weren't, weren't putting God in the priority they should have in their lives. And as a result, there had been a three-year drought up to this point. And Elijah confronts this idolatry by putting God's power on display in the story. So starting in verse 20, it says, so Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Two opinions. That word there for two opinions, it's like double-mindedness. It's the thing talked about in James. It said if you're double-minded, you don't receive anything from the Lord because it's doubt. You're wavering between two thought processes. So he's confronting them. Why are you double-minded? Verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal has prophets, 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is the God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. So here we have Elijah going, you know what? You people, you've been unfaithful to the Lord. You're not hearing them. You're not spending time with them. You're putting your focus on other things. You're missing out what he's made available to you. So he calls them to this place, like we're just going to solve this once and for all. We'll have two sacrifices, and the prophets of Baal, 450 men, up against Elijah, one man. <coughs> so then in verse 25 so Elijah said to the prophets of Baal choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first for you are many and call on the name of your God but put no fire under it then they took the ox which was given to them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying oh Baal answer us but there was no voice and no one answered and they leaped about the altar which they made came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or he has gone inside. Or is on a journey, and perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and even cut themselves, according to their custom, with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. It's an important dis distinction to make here. So as they're worshiping their god, their custom was to cut themselves and bleed themselves out. Isn't it interesting that when you worship Jesus, that he was the God who went and bled for us. He bled for us. They're thinking, if I bleed for my God, I will somehow get him to work on my behalf. So they're cutting themselves, they're bleeding out. In 
verse 29. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a, a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it out on the burnt offering on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. Then he said, A third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. He also filled the trench with water. So here he fills this. Now I want to make a special note because it says first when he came that he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. And what did he do? He brought 12 stones. That reminded them of the, the, the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. Why is this important? It's important because if we've been lacking in worship in our lives, one of the ways that we rebuild that altar of worship in our lives is to get the testimonies of what God has done in our life as stones and build that altar. It's built with testimony, of going back and remembering. If you struggle with finances and you remember the time the Lord delivered you from financial problems, you go remember it. If you struggle with health issues and you remember seeing God heal you or somebody else, you grab on that testimony and you put that as a stone on your altar of worship. That's how you build that, that, that stone in the altar back is by grabbing testimonies and bringing them in front of you. I remember when God did this. I remember when God did that. And that's where you build an altar. It's what Elijah did. Then he poured water all over the thing just so there'd be no mistake. Nobody's going to be able to say that he got up there and hit some flint stone on it or something. He pours water all over it. He's going to give the people a testimony. So at the time of the offering of the evening, Elijah the prophet came near, this is verse 36, and said, now I want to pay attention to this, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. That right there shows the motive that was going behind what was about to happen. What was his motive for praying? Number one, let it be known that you are God. He was looking for God to put his power on display so there'd be no confusion about who God is. That was one of the motives of his prayer. Then it was, let them know that I'm your servant. He wanted to live in such a way and walk with God in such a way that when people looked at him, they're like, that's a believer. This should be something we're asking the Lord. When we go out, we should be asking the Lord, Lord, today through my life, let it be known that you're God. And let it be known that I'm the one who follows you. We do that by learning to follow Christ and living like him. So those two things, let it be known that you are God, that he was a servant of God. And the third thing was, I have done all these things at your word. So the other motive was... And what showed here is that Elijah had been praying to the Lord and everything that he did with calling for the, 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 the animals and for the, the um, sacrifice to be made on Mount Carmel, all that, he's saying, I've done these things at your word. He wasn't up there just doing it on his own. So what's he showing us here? A strong prayer life. He was talking to God and giving direction. He didn't presume to know God's will and go up there. It's probably a good idea. 450 priests and just you, you're probably going to die. He didn't like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show him. I'm going to go up there on that mountain. And I'm going to have this whole sacrifice standoff thing. We'll see what happens. If it wasn't God telling him to do it, good chance God doesn't do anything. And he looks like an idiot and then dies after. You know what I mean? God's not being seen as God. He's not being seen as servant of the Lord. He's being seen as an imposter if he doesn't do it at the will of God. So he's saying, I've done all these things at your word. Meaning, I took time to hear you. I took time to follow you. And I'm up here in obedience. I'm up here doing this in obedience. So in verse 37, he continues his prayer. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned your heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. 
When the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Do you see what happened? He went up there at the word of the Lord. In prayer, God gave him the specifics of what he was to go do. He goes and does it in obedience. And look what God does. Now remember this. Oftentimes when we come and pray to the Lord, sometimes our prayer life, we're looking for God to provide us a safe situation. Right? You pray and go, oh Lord, please deliver me from this enemy. And the Lord's way of delivering might be a good idea. Go up and get in front of them, pick a fight with them by telling them that they're wrong, and then I'll show up and save you. You see how this could be problematic? How this could be a little bit dangerous? God looking for our faith mixed with obedience. That's the key ingredient. So Elijah's here looking for 450 prophets who have led my people to worship false gods. And then there's just me remaining as a servant of the Lord. And in prayer, the Lord tells him, here's what I want you to do. Go create a standoff. So he does. And what happens out of that is, and I don't know, like I said, practice this. Put yourself into this position, into, into Elijah's position. Can you imagine sitting there and there's an altar and there's 450 priests dancing around that thing, screaming and yelling and, and asking their God to light this on fire to prove how powerful they are. I might be thinking, hey, stay away from the altar. I bet you he's got like a flint stone. He's going to try to do this. Man, if, if that thing lights on fire, I'm going to die. You know, oh, that guy over there, he got a torch. He looks like he's getting a little close. He better not try to cheat. Man, do you see how the worries would creep in? But he's not worried at all. Instead, he starts mocking him. Maybe your God's asleep. Like, I wouldn't want to provoke 450 people. Maybe, maybe he's on a trip and can't hear you. You should scream louder than they're over there cutting themselves. I mean, he's crazy. You should do that louder. Do it again. Man, that cut was deep. Man, you're bleeding, man. Ooh. Yeah, you should scream louder, bro. Right? He's over there doing that, and, and the, the fire is not coming. And then he says, okay, now my turn. I bring the testimonies of God, and I build an altar. Bring water. Pour it over this thing. Pour it over. We don't want anybody to miss what God's about to do. And then he worships God and says, let it be known today who you are, that I'm your servant, and I did this because you told me to. And boom, the fire falls. That's prayer. But the main thing here we want to focus on is the motive of his, of his praying. Okay, his motive was that people would know that God is God, that people would know that he was a servant of God, and that God speaks to his, his servants. Where else do we see that? Check this out in John 14. In John 14, starting in verse 12, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who believes in me and the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Here's why. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's that motive again. That the Father be glorified, lifted up because of Jesus. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to answer your prayers. Because when I answer your prayers, I'm glorifying the Father. I'm lifting him up so people know he is who we say he is. So he says he'll answer the prayers, whatever we ask in his name. And then he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. So the motive was to glorify God. But in James 4, we have this issue. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That's James 4, 3. That we can ask and we don't receive because we ask with wrong motives so that we may spend it on our pleasures. Where it can also mean desires. So here's a key part to the answer prayer. Because remember, you were designed for answer prayers. The key part is we get the motive, the right motive. How do we get that? Through transformed desire. How do we get that? By spending time with the Lord in worship. Learning to be with Him, reading His Word. I'm guilty of this. How many of you have, at times, you pray and you're like, man... Like, like, I have a good car. I have, I have two cars that work. I have a place to, to live. But how many times like, do we get into a place where we start asking the Lord for things and the motive, like for me, I've experienced times where my motive for asking God for more has been because I'm not thankful for what I have. Mm-hmm. When I really get down to the root of it, sometimes I'm just walking in a lack of thankfulness. But when I'm content, it totally changes my prayers. 
right? Because motive is key and, and transformed desires are key. So what's one of the things we should be praying for? That God would transform our desires and implant right motives in us. This is important. It's even when we're praying for, for people who haven't met the Lord yet. Do we want to be praying like, Lord, please show those people that you're right? Are we praying that God encounter them just because we want to be right about what we're saying? Or do we have a true heart of passion that's going, Lord, we want you to encounter them because you love them and they need you? Motive is important. It's extremely important. Because it says right here that we don't have, because we ask with wrong motive, that we could spend it on our desires. So we're coming to God, treating prayer sometimes as if it's like a credit card, like a divine credit card. Like, hey, God says, I just pray and I'm going to get it. <laughs> what he invites us into through his son is intimacy with him so that way our lives are united. And we don't ever think, act, or talk in a way that's not with the unitedness with Christ in mind. We have to keep that in mind. We have to let him de de develop our motives in us. So the key to answered prayer is transform desires. So how do you shape your motives? It really comes by spending time in the presence of God. Of being with him and asking him. It's okay. Sometimes I found, let me say it like this. I don't like things that don't work. I really don't. Like for me, prayer used to frustrate me because I'd be praying and I'm like, it's not working. If it's not working, I don't want to do it. Because why am I asking God to help me with this and then it's not, I'm not getting help. I could just go figure out the problem on my own. That was my logic behind it. But I started practicing. I go through the scripture and I started studying the places where Jesus taught how to pray. And I figured if that worked for Jesus, I'll go ahead and give it a start. So then from there, I went and I started putting it in practice. One of the things the Lord taught his disciples is not to pray. Let me see, I start find the scripture. In Matthew 6, verse 7, he says, When you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So one of the things I did in prayer is I got rid of the repetition. How many of you have done that where you pray over and over and over? You know what I found for myself? I wasn't really praying in faith. I was just trying to pray a lot to make myself feel better. Right? I was praying because if I prayed enough, you ever reach that point where you're like, okay, I think I prayed enough. And then you feel like, huh, there's, that's a weight off. That's really just becoming comfortable with doubt. It's really what's happening. You're praying and praying and praying and doubt's feeling uncomfortable, so you pray some more. Doubt's feeling really uncomfortable, so you pray some more. But then at some point you get comfortable with it, and then I think I'm going to stop praying. It's just becoming comfortable with doubt. So what did I do? I went, specifically one time, I didn't have money for tires for my car, and I prayed, and I said, well, I guess the Lord doesn't want repetition from me. But I was like... Because my mind works like this sometimes. Like, I'm always trying to get one over on them. So I'm like, okay, I can't say more words, but what I can do is I can think of some acts to do while I'm praying. Like, for example, in the city of Jericho, the nation of Israel marched around the city so the walls would fall. I'm going to ask God for tires one time, and I'm going to walk around the car. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like ritualistic, right? I was desperate. There was a lot of doubt there. But I was trying to be obedient, not be long-winded. So I walked around the car and I prayed and I told the Lord I need tires for this car. And I left it. About, I don't know, maybe it was a couple months later. I still had a little life on them. I like to push them to the wires for popping out. You know, so I had a little life. So a couple months later, my dad comes up to me and he's like, hey, I got some tires. Do you think you could use them? He has them in the back of his pickup. I'm like, probably not. You got big old diesel, you know, they're not going to fit. And he goes, I don't know. I was running some smaller tires on this truck before, and I, I got some new ones. And he goes, it just so happens on this diesel when I'm pulling weight by my Dodge, he goes, it wears out the inner ones in a weird pattern. So once I'm going to change those inner tires on the dually, I'm just getting rid of all of them. So there's two bad tires, just so happens to be four good ones with like over half life left on those things. Mm -hmm. And they're the exact size of my car. 
stuff like that just started happening for me. God's providing. So then, in my mind, I'm like, this is awesome. I need to try this more often. I'm not going to ask too much. Like, I'm not going to say too many words. But if I pray and then walk in the circle, it's going to help me. Right? Come on. We all do this. We all do this. Well, maybe not. Okay? <laughs> but I just went through and asking the Lord, how do I pray? A couple verses before that, Jesus says this, same chapter, Matthew 6, in verse 5, he also says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their full reward. That's a scary one, isn't it? I spent some time one time noticing that when I prayed, I just wanted people around me to know that like, I was serious about the issue. Being honest with you. Have you ever done that where you pray and it's like, here's an example. There's been times when I've prayed when as I'm praying, I'm praying with boldness. I'm praying with the illusion of faith. It looks like faith. sounds like faith. You know, I might even be moving a little bit like, Lord, I trust you, God. You know, and I'm getting loud. And inside I know that I'm like, this ain't going to work out at all. Like, what am I going to do, Right. Now, for pride's sake, maybe we could do that because we want people to see us in the right way. But as we get closer to God, that's, that's pointless. That's worthless, too. It's no way to come to prayer. What we do is we come to the Lord, and I started changing my prayer prayer like this. I come to the Lord, and I'll be like, Father, you see me, and there's nothing hidden from you. You know I have no faith for this. I know, like, everything I know about you, Lord, like, I'm not going to play games I could quote the scriptures at you, but you're going to be unimpressed that I know because I don't really believe right now. Like, I feel that. I don't believe. I'm struggling. Would you help my unbelief? Why do I do that? Because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. When I'm struggling with faith, I ask him to author it. When we run into prayer is when we start seeing ourselves as a source. Like, if I bring myself to God with enough knowledge, with enough understanding, and I'm like, I'm going to convince you, Lord, I have faith. Let's do it. He sees right to all that if it's doubt. What we want to do is come to him like children and just be straight up honest. Lord, I'm not sure about this one. Would you show me what to do? Lord, I don't even know how to get faith for this. Would you show me what to do? Just jump to that conclusion. Get to that point where you just go right to God and just be honest. Just pat, bypass all the fake stuff. You know, I think, I think I'm going to share this before. Maybe I don't remember when it was, but I, pray, I, I preached a sermon years and years ago on healing. I was really proud of myself. Have you ever had one of those times where you, maybe you said something or it, it just sounded good and you're like, that was good. I'm proud of that. <laughs> right? I walked out from the stage feeling like that was one of the best teachings I've done on healing. And no joke, as the thought came to mind, I walked down off the stage and I get to about right here. My foot hits and I hear, oh, you think that was good? Now I want you to live it. And as I heard that from the Lord, I looked over and a woman walking towards me who looked like she'd been in a car accident and didn't have the bones put back together was walking towards me, broken. And I stopped and looked at her just, oh, I got no faith for this. Can you imagine? You just get done preaching on healing and then you're like, no, nah, I can't do it. What was that? That was evidence of a lacking prayer life. That was evidence of lacking being in the Lord. I could give doctrine and I could try to be right. But I wasn't in unity with him where I could bring him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for prayer, we're called to just walk with Jesus. To learn to see things how he does. So when his disciples asked him, would you teach us to pray? He goes into the Lord's prayer. And he lines out these same motives again that you see with Elijah. Same ones. In verse 9 of Matthew 6, he says, Pray then in this way. What's the first thing he does? Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Glory be your name. Lift high your name. What did Elijah say? Lord, let it be known today that you're God. Same motive. It starts with, Lord, let him see you. That was the first motive of prayer. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Now we're looking for God to move. 
We're looking for him to do his work. So we're going, God, receive all the glory. Make yourself known to these people. Then we're saying, bring your kingdom here. On earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, things happen the way you say. And on earth, they need to happen the way that you say. So we're praying for God to do his work here. Then it says, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Think about this. So provide for us as we have need. Elijah, God provided for him. Even the ravens brought him food. But it says, and forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Remember Elijah, he prayed and asked the Lord that God would be glorified and that they would know that he was a servant of God. You know how people know we're a servant of God? When we forgive as he's forgiven us. Same motive. So the motive is in prayer is to come forward and say, Lord, I want you to be glorified in this. And I want people to see that I'm a son. Or I'm a daughter and that I'm a child of God because I live like you do. That means I'm laid down. I don't need to be right. I don't need to be trying to out there arguing with people. I just want to show that you're God by how I love well. I want them to see you in me. And then we go after what he says to do. Because the next part in the motive is we have a motive of listening and hearing. A desire to hear him. So a transformed desire is this. We want God's glory above all else. We want to be submitted to him in such a way that when people see us, they see him. And then we take time to listen because when we listen, when we hear, that we know what to do. Does that make sense? <clears throat> then we know what to do. And then be obedient. That's the easy part. Not really. But then be obedient. Does that make sense? Do you see how we, we can be transformed in our motives and our thinking so we can go and do what God's called us to do? We have to. Because this is what we're called to. But prayer really is about walking in intimacy with the Lord. It's fun. And I want to encourage you, what I felt like the Lord really wanted me to encourage you today through this, is gives us a way to start developing our motives, developing and retransforming our desires in His presence. But also know this, God wants to hang out with you. Like He's not mad. He doesn't want to be distant. As a church, we need to make sure we push that message forward. Because if we're not living in such a way where people are like, man, I want to hang out with you. We're not modeling Christ. We want people to see us and go, man, I want to know this, God, because the way that you act, the way that you love, I see God at work in you. You pray, stuff happens. Because we're doing it not for us, but for the Lord. I remember one time the Lord asked me, would I give up my earthly desires if he would give himself to me? As soon as he asked that question, I immediately felt this like rush of memories come into my mind of I knew all these desires that I had. And they were all stuff for myself, right? They were all stuff for myself. And he said, would you give that all up? But I'll give myself to you. And it took me a little bit to, to answer that because I wanted to be honest. But I just thought this, do, do we realize that God has given himself to us? And are we taking hold of every opportunity that he's given us? He's given all of you the opportunity to come before him in prayer. You don't need a church and you don't need a pastor to do it. He's given it to you. He wants to hang out with you. In fact, there's times where God wants to hang out with you when if I walked in the room, the Lord would be like, hey, Daniel, can you wait out there, man? I want to hang, hang out. Because he wants to be with you and get to know you to transform you, to, to, for you to, to share your heart with him and him to share his heart with you, for you to walk so close together that you just go and do what he does. And when your motives are transformed, your desires are transformed, so you want him the way he wants you, because that's what it's about, right? That's what it's about. When we talk about transformed desires, we're not saying that God's looking at you, judging your desires, being like, you know what, you desire the wrong thing. I saved you from a life of you know death, and you know, look at you. 
Look how you're living. You're a disappointment to me. That's not him. He's looking at you going, I want your desires to shift in this way. I want you to desire me as much as I desire you. That's what he's talking about. When that happens, when we desire him the way he desires us, sparks fly. Sparks fly. Then it becomes fun. You're out there going, man, I can't wait to talk to the Lord about this one, to ask him what to do. He's going, oh, I'll, sh I'll show you exactly what to do, just like Elijah. But I'm telling you, there are moments of learning. But the time will come where you may find yourself standing on a hilltop, surrounded by all kinds of things that are not glorifying God, that want to hurt people that God wants to save. And in faith, you listen to God and you step out in boldness and you go put yourself in a circumstance that seems impossible. And because you do, God's glorified. The people see you as a son or daughter of God. And then people want to experience God. That should excite our hearts. That God wants to get to know you in such a way where that's possible. He's not, trust me, the Lord's not looking at, at us and going, well, you got a pastor. And uh, the rest of you just do whatever he says. He's going, hey, Daniel, point them at me. Give what you have to give so they can go to do and receive everything that I have for them. Yeah, He's looking at you. So I challenge you this week. Spend time in prayer. Spend time talking to the Lord, just being honest. If your prayer life right now feels like, Lord, here's what I feel like is wrong with me. It's okay. Talk to Him. Just be honest. Sometimes we're taught, and this is a religious spirit thing. This really is. A religious spirit tells you when you come before the king, you better come in honor. Who cares how you feel? You better look happy. You know, who cares what's going on in your life? You better make him think you're happy to be there, right? That's a religious spirit that tells you to come in that way. So you come before the Father and you're looking and you're praying and he's like, how are you doing? It's like, wonderful. And he's like, you're lying. <laughs> Our God is not a God that wants us to lie to him. He doesn't need us to try to make him feel good. You know that? He's not up there going, man, I'm having a horrible day. If only some of my kids would show up and make me feel better. But they showed up this morning and they were having a horrible day too. I think I should just smite them. <laughs> Not what we're dealing with. <laughs> we're dealing with the God who's going, man, my day's always wonderful. I'm the definition of wonderful. I am God. I'm love. Come to me. <clears throat> or you're having a horrible day, tell me all about it. You don't feel like you have faith? Tell me. Feel like you're suffering from doubts? Okay, tell me. You want me to walk with you? Ask me. I'd love to do that. You want me to hang out with you? 100%. You want me to skip church with you, go get a coffee? You got it. <laughs> That's how good he is. Prayer is what activates really like the frontier of the spiritual life. It's available to you. And I just want to ask the Lord to give it to you, to give you a hunger for prayer that's beyond what we've had before, all of us. Because it's in that place the scripture talks to us about praying without ceasing. We should. How do we do it? We just become ever mindful of him the way he's ever mindful of us. How do we do that? We ask him. I don't know how to do it on my own power. I honestly don't. I tried for years. The best thing I did, I found, was to ask him. <laughs> Is I ask him for everything I need. Why? It says in James, if you lack wisdom, what's wisdom? How to walk out knowledge. So if you lack that, he says, ask and believe. But then he warns, don't be double-minded, don't doubt, because if you do, you won't receive. It's not that God's watching us judging, going, oh, look at you with your doubt. I was about to give it to you, but attitude problem, you doubter, right? That's not God. He's going, align with me. Doubt takes you out of reach. Faith brings you in. And then he's so good that he's like the faith of a mustard seed, tiny speck, just, just a little So we just ask. Don't be many words because many words will rob you of faith. Just say, Lord, I want a hunger for prayer like I've never had before. Would you give it to me? I want a hunger for you like I've never had before. Would you give it to me? I want a hunger for a relationship with you the way Jesus hungered for a relationship with you. Would you give it to me? And then thank him. And then wait to get rocked because I guarantee it will happen. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Just put your hands out in front of you. I'm going to ask the Lord to bless you with the gift this morning. So, Lord, 
Father, you're good. And again, Father, we say happy Father's Day to you. Thank you for how you love us. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for being near. So Lord, I ask you now to give each person here hunger for a relationship with you that's beyond anything they've experienced before. I pray that you give each person here a desire to walk with you the way Jesus did. It goes beyond anything they've ever experienced. I pray that you give them a hunger to pray. And I pray, Lord, that that, that hunger would manifest in a way that as they're going about their daily lives, that they would just have you coming to mind. That they would include you in their daily processes. That when they run into a problem, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be in ranching. It could be working on a car. It could be doing taxes, Lord. Whatever the problem looks like, that they would even then pray to you and ask about it. That they would include you in everything, Lord. So, Lord, we give you glory today. We thank you for your love and for your grace. We thank you that we are designed for answered prayers. And that you're aligning us with you so we can see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that we would see people be touched and transformed by your love. And that we would live in such a way with you that when people see us, they see you. So transform us that we would be those who love well and who have joy and peace and kindness in our lives in such a way that people know there's something different. Because we want you to be glorified and for them to have a relationship with you to experience the joy of being in your presence. So we give you glory today, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you guys this week. Pray, pray, pray. It's going to be fun. And until then, actually, I'm going to give you a place to practice. Just come next door. We have some food over there before you eat. Pray over it. You're welcome. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.